Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and this is a short application example of an electrically controlled hydraulic system. Our objective is to examine both the hydraulic schematic and ladder logic diagram to predict the behavior of an electrically controlled hydraulic system using both operator-initiated manual input and automatic mechanical input, in this case, a magnetic proximity switch to extend and retract a hydraulic cylinder a single cycle. Such an action is commonly known as a single cycle reciprocation. Additionally, we'll introduce a couple problems with our system and see if we can predict this system's response given these input scenarios. The goal of this system is to use a manually activated push button to initiate the single cycle reciprocation action. At the limits of travel, the cylinder will automatically retract. Such a system could be used to perform some industrial task, like punching or bending a workpiece. This lecture is meant to be a continuation of the single cycle reciprocation with limit switch lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. For the most part, everything about the two systems is identical, right down to the normally closed limit switch in our first rung. The one exception being the funny looking diamond surrounding it. This symbol represents a solid state magnetic proximity switch, PX1. Magnetic proximity switches are used to detect the presence or absence of a magnetic object inside the range of a magnetic field produced by the switch without the necessity of having to make physical contact with the object. The magnetic proximity switch associated with this contact also appears in the hydraulic schematic as a diamond mounted on the barrel of the cylinder. Two important points exist inside the magnetic proximity switch's range. When a magnetic object enters the operating point, the associated contacts change their opposite states. In this case, our normally closed contact will open. Upon leaving the release point, the switch will return to its deactivated state. In this case, our normally closed contact will reclose. Note the overlap between these two regions in physical space. This is known as hysteresis, or span, and very similar in nature to that exhibited by a pressure switch, which activates at a certain set level when pressure is rising and deactivates at another smaller reset level when pressure is falling. This region is desirable because it prevents switch chatter when the sensed quantity is hovering at a level close to activation, or in our case, a magnetic object hanging just inside the operating point and experiencing physical vibration or electrical noise. Note in contrast to a regular physical limit switch, this means of detection needn't be binary in nature, i.e. the mutually exclusive decision of yes it's there or no it's not, but could be a measurable quantity relayed not by a proximity switch, but rather a magnetic proximity sensor or transducer. A sensor, if you recall correctly, returns not a mutually exclusive on or off signal as would a switch, but rather an analog voltage or current value proportional to the measured quantity. This measured quantity could then be relayed to a computer or a PLC where the programmed instructions can make decisions based off this value or a digitized representation of this value could be stored for later analysis. Additionally, magnetic proximity switches serve as essential components to some types of non-contact tachometers. Due to the non-contact nature of the magnetic proximity switch, the rotational speed of a shaft can be accurately determined without unduly influencing it. For example, a pulsar is a type of non-contact tachometer that detects the presence or absence of a magnetic tag on a shaft. Every time the tag passes the magnetic proximity switch, the switch changes states. In addition to the magnetic proximity switch, additional circuitry like a counter and timer make the calculation of rotational speed possible, all without the necessity of making physical contact with a shaft. If a pulsar detected 30 such transitions in a period of one second using a single magnetic tag, the rotational speed of the shaft can be calculated as 30 revolutions per second, or more appropriately, 1,800 RPM. In our case, this is a normally closed magnetic proximity switch which will activate or open when the special magnetic piston face inside our cylinder barrel travels into the operating region while the rod is extended. This is a pretty neat application because not only does this type of limit switch no longer need to make physical contact with our extending rod, depending on where you place the proximity switch on the barrel, you can vary the travel length of the rod. If you want to shorten the stroke, the magnetic proximity switch can be brought closer to the cap end. If you want to lengthen the stroke, the magnetic proximity switch can be brought closer to the rod end. 
Lest you think the proximity switch is the end-all, be-all solution to every possible situation requiring position detection, be aware there exist drawbacks that require consideration. The first being cost. A solid-state magnetic proximity switch may cost more than a simple physical limit switch with a rocker arm. The second disadvantage being power consumption. The magnetic proximity switch must be powered for it to function at all. While not a wasteful high power device, if the switch is to generate the magnetic field necessary to detect magnetic objects, it requires additional wires to power this circuitry in addition to those wires terminating the normally open or normally closed contacts. As is often the case, more wires mean more problems. Often these additional power wires are not explicitly drawn in the ladder logic diagram since they don't make decisions. However, they are critical for the proper functionality of this system. If the ladder logic diagram goes to the trouble of featuring those additional power connections, you might see two additional wires leading to the outside of the diamond shaped schematic symbol directly connected to the vertical upright rails of the ladder logic diagram. Additionally, a magnetic proximity switch only detects magnetic objects. To detect the presence of a non-magnetic object without actually touching it, you may need to rely on a capacitive proximity sensor which uses an electrostatic field for detection instead of inductive means, or a photoelectric eye which uses light. Finally, the ability to detect magnetic objects is both a blessing and a curse. Such a switch could be falsely triggered by a dirty industrial environment, or the errant passage of another magnetic object inside this range. Rather than being at the limits of travel as in our previous example of an electrical controlled hydraulic system, the magnetic proximity switch is mounted to the side of the cylinder inside a safe environment. As a special magnetic piston face travels inside the barrel while the rod is extending, the magnetic proximity switch detects its presence when it passes by. This modification is advantageous for several reasons. First, the limit switch in our previous example must make physical contact with our extended rod. In that previous lecture, we discussed situations in which the limit switch could be totally missed or the rocker arm completely broken off. Second, the sheer fact that you need to touch the limit switch at all really limits the application of this type of circuit. Let's say the rod is entering a caustic or hazardous environment like a nuclear reactor or your lazy lab partner's dirty apartment. These are environments that may damage the limit switch or at the very least present a region of space you do not wish to occupy while repairing said limit switch. By all means, pause the lecture and give yourself a brief tour of both the hydraulic schematic and ladder logic diagram and see if you can predict how this system works. Again, this system is exactly like the system we discussed in the single cycle reciprocation of the limit switch lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. With a minor modification of the normally closed limit switch, activated by the rod at the limits of extension, being replaced by a normally closed magnetic proximity switch, PX1, being activated by the piston face at the limits of extension. Let's start by walking up and virtually pressing the start button on our ladder logic diagram. Given the e-stop, stop, and PX1 are all normally closed, we have a complete path of current and the coil of control relay CR1 energizes. All the contacts associated with control relay CR1 change their opposite state. CR1A closes, as does CR1B. Given the holding contact CR1A is closed, an operator can now release the momentary contact start push button. The start push button returns to its deactivated normally open state. However, we still have a complete path of current through the holding contact to energize the coil of control relay CR1. That's the point of the holding contact. It maintains the last asserted state. In our third rung, via the closed CR1B contact, DCB1 sole A energizes. On the hydraulic side, the solenoid actuated valve moves the spool to the straight through position and pressurized flow enters the cap end the cylinder starts extending. It will stay in this state until the extending piston face enters the operating point of the magnetic proximity switch, PX1. Contact PX1 opens, which breaks the current path energizing the coil of control relay CR1. And all the contacts associated with control relay CR1 return to their deactivated state. CR1A opens and removes the holding circuit. CR1B opens. DCB1 sole A is de-energized. On the hydraulic side, the de-energized solenoid returns the spool to the cross-connect position. Pressurized flow enters the rod end and the cap end is jumped to tank, and the cylinder retracts. Note once the piston face leaves the release point of the magnetic proximity switch PX1, contact PX1 recloses. Once the cylinder fully retracts or otherwise reaches the limits of travel, the pressure relief valve opens 
and we've returned to our start state and are ready and waiting to initiate another single cycle reciprocation at the touch of a button. Note the normally closed e-stop and normally closed stop buttons both serve similar purposes with slight variations. Like the normally closed PX1 contact, both of these buttons serve to de-energize the coil of control relay CR1 when they are actuated into their open position. The normally closed stop button is momentary in nature and returns to its deactivated closed state upon being released by an operator. The function and purpose of the e-stop is similar with one minor exception. When actuated into the open position by an operator observing some unsafe scenario, the e-stop maintains the activated open position and does not immediately return to the deactivated closed state. This effectively renders the start button useless in that while the e-stop is open, closure of the start button will not initiate the single cycle reciprocation action. That's the point. The maintain contact e-stop serves to not only disable the system, it also serves to keep the system disabled until such a time an operator resets the e-stop into the closed position. This analysis may seem tedious and time consuming to some. However, this level of consideration is really the punchline behind every lab I've ever run and every example problem or lecture I've ever posted on the Big Bad Tech channel. Imagine how well things will go if you know what you're doing. Think about it before you act. Show up prepared. Really take your time and visualize what's happening before you even step foot into lab. Don't just rush to build something and grope stupidly at switches hoping you'll randomly arrive at the same number in the back of the book. Understanding takes time and effort and practice, but does return rewards. Here's a short clip showing what a functional system might look like during regular operation. Again, the only real difference between this and our last example was the magnetic proximity switch versus the physical limit switch. I don't know about you, but I think this is a pretty cool application. If you're still with me, let's learn some more. What could go wrong with this system? How could it break? How could you identify potential problems? The most important step in troubleshooting a malfunctioning system is to understand how the system is intended to work. That's what we just did. You simply cannot perform troubleshooting without performing this step. Keep in mind there is no limit to the wrong that can happen in the real world, but let's imagine some hypothetical troubleshooting scenarios. Now, since this system is only a subtly modified version of the single cycle reciprocation with limit switch circuit we examined in a previous lecture, all of those previous troubleshooting scenarios are equally as valid. Let's examine a couple more additional troubleshooting scenarios common to both systems or those particular to this single cycle reciprocation circuit with magnetic proximity switch. Note that this single cycle reciprocation circuit featuring the magnetic proximity switch as well as our previous one featuring the physical limit switch both exhibit low or no voltage protection characteristics. While not really a troubleshooting scenario, it is worthy considering the behavior of three-wire control systems during an unexpected power outage. If the system was in the act of extending and experienced a sudden loss of pilot power, the coil of control relay CR1 would be de-energized and all the associated contacts, CR1A and CR1B, would return to their deactivated open state. When CR1A opens, it removes the holding, latching, memory, or seal-in circuit. When CR1B opens, DCV1 sole A is de-energized, and DCV1 returns to the spring offset cross-connect position. If primary hydraulic power was still present, the cylinder would retract. If, however, primary hydraulic power was also lost, the cylinder would stall in this position. When pilot power is restored, the system does not immediately return to the act of extending the cylinder because the holding circuit has been broken. If the cylinder stalled mid-stroke due to a loss of primary hydraulic power, the restoration of flow through the deactivated spring offset cross-connect position would see the cylinder retract. Only when an operator makes the conscious decision to extend the cylinder and actively presses the start button does it do so. Low or no voltage protection circuits like this one prevent an operator from being injured by a sudden unexpected extension of this actuator when power is restored. This being said, the restoration of primary hydraulic power can cause it to retract. Let this be a warning to those individuals that work on such systems. Consider a scenario in which both the hydraulic system and the ladder logic are properly connected and perfectly functional. However, the magnetic proximity switch just isn't powered up due to faulty internal circuitry or an inadvertently unconnected power wire. 
In this case, the normally closed contact, PX1, is still normally closed, so the cylinder will extend. However, upon reaching the limits of extension, there's simply no magnetic field being generated by the switch to detect the magnetic piston face entering the operating region. Despite the fact the magnetic piston face is sitting right on its head, the proximity switch is asleep on the job. The PX1 contact doesn't open and does not signal the system it's time to retract the cylinder and the cylinder remains extended. An operator must now rely on the stop push button to manually retract the rod at the limits of travel. Consider the opposite scenario in which the magnetic proximity switch is functional and fully powered. However, an errant chunk of magnetic material is sticking to the barrel inside the operating region of the switch. Even in the fully retracted condition, PX1 is activated into the open position. Despite repeatedly pressing the start push button, no complete path would exist to energize the coil of control relay CR1 and the cylinder would refuse to extend. To facilitate troubleshooting, solid state magnetic proximity switches often include indicator LEDs that signal whether the switch is being triggered or not. A technician assigned with troubleshooting this scenario would notice the magnetic proximity switch being inadvertently triggered by the errant metal object inside the operating region. For this reason, low-level maintenance tasks often include cleaning systems to ensure no accumulations of industrial garbage inadvertently trigger critical sensors. Here's a magnetic proximity switch appropriately detecting the presence or absence of a manual interlock. Here's a magnetic proximity switch inappropriately detecting the presence or absence of an errant metal object inside its operating point. Such a false trigger could be used to trick a system into a different state, or just as easily destroy it with an inappropriate response. Let this be a cautionary tale to those that think the magnetic proximity switch is the best thing since they replaced the turd brown colored M&M with a blue one. Despite the advantages, there are drawbacks and limitations you need to be aware of when troubleshooting systems incorporating these most finicky of devices. All right, I think we've squeezed just about every teaching moment out of this circuit that we possibly can, so let's wrap it up. In conclusion, we examined both the hydraulic schematic and ladder logic diagram of an electrically controlled hydraulic system executing a single cycle reciprocation sequence, making use of a magnetic proximity switch. Additionally, we examined the advantages and limitations of magnetic proximity switches. Finally, we examined some hypothetical troubleshooting scenarios and discussed possible sources of and solutions to these problems. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. I will see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank <laughs> you.